Welcome to our weekly Friday talk and tour series when we share the opportunity to visit the studios of our wonderful artists and hear about their works and inspiration. These visits are brought to you by the Duncan McClellan Gallery and the DMG School Project of St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, it was good to see some of you during this week. Um, and uh, we've had a busy week. Uh, we have a, a great artist today that has been a great friend of the gallery. Uh, and I think when you see, uh, you probably already know of his work, but uh, getting to have a better idea of how it's made and, and why it's made. Um, so I think you'll find it very entertaining. We've been laughing all week. Uh, as you know, these are a great deal of work. Uh, I want to thank our whole team, Mary, Danielle, and Irene for putting all this together, uh, as well as uh, Eric's team, uh, that uh, I think you'll really like it. But more than anything, I, I really want to thank you for being here and supporting us not only uh, by coming on uh, each week um, and uh, supporting us in the gallery. So it's great to have you uh, and thank you very much for being here. Mary, please take it away. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, it's been such a pleasure uh, during this whole series to have you join us for our wonderful artists. But this week we have someone really, really special. Um, Eric Hilton and uh, James Allen will be joining us later on in the presentation. It's been such a pleasure working with Eric and with James over the past years. And it's also um, been a great pleasure working with Eric's wife, Sarah, and daughter, Erin, uh, over the past few weeks to put all this together. We're going to be treated to a relatively, relatively brief synopsis of what is an illustrious career, um, only to date because uh, Eric is still in the middle of creating and he and James Allen are producing a wonderful new series, which we'll see. Um, and it's a fascinating new body of work that they're creating together, as well as we'll see some uh, really important historical work and some uh, new uh, work that Eric has made singularly. So sit back and enjoy. This will be a very full presentation. It will run the full hour. Feel free to enter chats and comments in the chat button, uh, uh, questions and comments in the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And to see the speaker, Eric or James, um, please go to the, your upper right hand corner and choose the speaker view on your screen. That way you'll see not only the presentation, but a full view of Eric. So sit back and enjoy, and please feel free to enter questions and comments. And we look forward to checking in with you later on in the presentation, but Eric, so, so well, uh, pleased to have you and have James with us. So um, start the presentation whenever you're ready. We're really excited. Thank you. Hi, um, uh, <clears throat> said he. I am here uh, upstate New York at the moment. And uh, first of all, before we start this adventure, I'd like to thank Duncan, who I met a number of years ago. And uh, I realized that his name had Scottish ancestry. So I looked up the various clans and found out that his clan and my clan were friendly. So I could have a relationship with them. You see, they do that all the time in Scotland. And then I met Mary, and Mary, bless her, has put up with me for years, toing and froing and working things out. We've had some fabulous conversations. So in order to begin, I want to take us on a wee adventure back in Scotland. See, the thing about me is, as you know by my accent, I'm from that area, and I will never lose my love for it. 
So up on the very north coast of Scotland, there's a mountain range, and this is one called Ben Loyal. All the Scottish mountains are bends. And uh, if you hear some wee sounds, I'll be pressing the wrong thing. Hang on a minute. Oh, okay. Oh, maybe we'll have to put it up now. We're going for a little swift tour of the area where I have a house on the north of Scotland. So we're going to some of the Scottish glens around the house, and then we come across this beautiful little croft house that sits in the bosom of a vast glen with huge mountains around it, and it's like the mountains are protecting the house. And there the people who are called crofters live and they look after the land and the sheep and one visits the beaches and all their moods. Like this is up on the northwest area near the house and when we were out there a few months ago you could see how the clouds were rolling in from the west and as they did so they cast their shadows across the stand, uh, sand creating images that one began to wonder about. Was this a prophecy of the future? Was darkness going to come? Would there be light in the future? And I think art, in my case, is all about understanding emotions and finding ways to express them, as you'll see as we move through the series of pieces. This is Ardnecki. It's a beautiful name, Ardnecki. It was whittled out of the land by the sea over centuries, millennia. And this little protuberance that sticks out was a place to shelter ships in the past. And now we come upon a ruined, desolate house, which is full of history. One of the histories of Scotland was the Highland Clearances. And that is when the people were cleared from their land to the sea. It was a terrible privation time. And this house is a remnant of houses that people lived in. They were driven to the edge of the sea where they starved where they couldn't make a living because it was the autumn, the autumn of the times of the harvest, and they burned the harvests and drove them to the end, edge of the sea, and then they emigrated. They emigrated across the ocean to the New World, to Canada, to America, Australia, all these other parts of the world that you find the names of these people. Now, I bought a wee house on the north coast of Scotland that was completely derelict. And I decided that I uh, would take time off where I was at the time and uh, refurbish, rebuild it so we could live in it. So this is me up on the roof building the dormer window. But now comes an important part of the tale. As I was standing there, I looked out across the, the fields, across the fields and in the mists, I saw this incredible looking person coming towards me and I could see she was a beautiful looking woman and I thought oh my goodness this is one of the myths of Scotland people find this kind of thing so having not fallen off the roof but climbing down and walking over the field I engaged with her and talked to her and she actually spoke the same language which was very entertaining and uh, we talked for a while and after a number of years of knowing each other, we got married. And this is, the, this is the house you saw me repairing early on. And this is our lovely house on the north coast of Scotland. And of course, the results of all these things often end in expectations we don't quite expect, shall we say. This is me as a young man with my lovely son, Kyle. And we're standing in front of a 3,000-year-old 3, stone rotunda called a Pictish Brock. And that stone, that gigantic triangular stone, is the doorway to the Brock. And now we come to a wee one of my lovely daughter. Um, I think here. I think it'll have to be wee button to press the wrong way. All right, and this is Erin. This is Erin, who is actually sitting close by in case her old father makes another mistake with the modern computer system. And Erin, as a wee lassie, we would go and investigate all that area with all its remains. And the one on the right-hand side is the young daughter standing. We used to laugh and say, oh, she's holding the, the, the Brock entrance way up with her wee head. 
and that's her on the on the on the left as she grew older and much more serious this is one of the photographs we took last year of the three of us up on the north coast of scotland into the early winter standing there having a great time with this um art nouveau house in the background that's been there for centuries and um myself eric Aaron in the center and Sarah on the right hand side. <clears throat> and um, as we advance into this, I just want to show you, this is a, an image of me uh, jumping from the rocks into my new life on the, in the promised land. And this is my uh, croft, my uh, studio that I built upstate New York uh, in the United States, New York State. And of course, the flag still flies. But to begin with, I talk, talk another wee bit about another part of the adventure, because <clears throat> my education was at Edinburgh College of Art. When I graduated from Edinburgh, I got a teaching position for a couple of years, teaching in forming a new foundation study program in the art college, after which I left Edinburgh and went to teach in Starbridge in uh, Starbridge College of Art in England, which has a huge glass program, beautiful, beautiful college. And from there, I went uh, to Birmingham College of Art and then drifted across to Canada. I get a call. <coughs> I'm sorry, I got tickling my throat. Um, so we went across, I went across to Canada and got a job teaching in the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And I taught there for a few years. And uh, then suddenly, out of the blue, a job appeared uh, that, thank you, excuse me for a minute. While I was in the University of Victoria um, in British Columbia, where the politics didn't work out, there was a job at the State University of New York at Alfred. So I went to the United States and I got this job teaching at Alfred. Now, while I was teaching at Alfred, I was teaching a, a bunch of students in the kiln room. And a gentleman was standing in the corner. And I asked somebody, who's that? Who's that guy? And they said, oh, that's Tom Beatner. He's uh, head of um, the museum at Corning and uh, Stuban Glass. So he came over to me and he said, are you at Hilton? I said, yeah. He says, well, I'm Tom Beekner. I says, yeah, I just heard you were. He says, um, look, I've seen your work in the Heller Gallery in New York. Would you like to come along and have a wee chat with us? So I said, oh, that would be very interesting. So I went over to, to Corning and we sat and we talked. And he said to me, you know, I'd really, I've seen your work. I'd really like you to come and maybe do a few designs for us. So what happened was I said, but I'm going back to Scotland. It was the holidays at Alfred. He says, okay. He says, go back to Scotland, do a bunch of drawings, send them over and let's see what we can talk about. So I did that. And the result of it was to come and work at Stuben. Okay. So we passed through the entrance to the, uh, we looked at the uh, studio and now we've walked through the inside door. And this is just a quick shot of the inside of the studio. That's one of Aaron's paintings on the wall. And this is the more aged Scotsman standing in front of the sandblaster. And I was doing this just to do the usual kind of demonstration one does of a, a certain activity inside the studio. These are some pieces that are uh, around and about. And uh, this is me standing uh, in front of the sandblaster uh, doing a redemonstration. And I'm sure many of you are very familiar by, of this, but I thought I'd better do it just, just to authenticize the possibility that I'm really what I think I am anyway. Okay, so Aaron has taken a shot through the sandblaster while I am holding the tool to sculpt away into the piece of glass. Okay, a little examination to have a wee look. Okay. Yeah, just hit that bottom. Um, all right, then. 
Okay, sorry. And these are some stills of me um, working on panels. And you can see I do an awful lot of drawing and the drawings are translated into the surface of the resist that is placed on the glass. Then it's cut and then one starts to work and cut away the different parts that are going to be sculpted into and eroded by the sandblasting process. So this is me making some, making some little shapes in the resist in order to sandblast the particular panel which I'm working on. This is uh, the opening in the sandblaster and this is me playing around with the resist as I'm sandblasting the panel. People have asked me why the gloves are sitting there and who's my helper, but actually they're just the gloves one uses when one's working on the process. I'm showing you this because it's a process happening as I sandblast into the surface of the disc of glass. The resist that is part of the design, uh, or shall we say protecting part of the future design, you can see how the process of sandblasting uh, starts to stain the edges of the resist, marked it with a pencil in order to see what else has to be done. And so one gradually moves from part to part and tries to interplay them together. Uh, this is an interesting one because it's me <laughs> in an outfit. And I got this commission for the Rockefeller Center, but it was 20 feet tall, 10 feet wide, and made of huge panels. And I didn't have a sandblaster to accommodate that. So I built a hut. And at the end of the hut, I built a sandblast room. But then, never having quite done it this way before, I found that I could probably make up a suit that would help me do it. So I made up this suit, uh, climbed into it, air coming flowing into it, and that's me standing working on the large panel. I had some help in these, in these days, and they would help me put the panel on the easel, and I was alone in there, and then we would uh, be protected, or I'd be protected by the outfit. But the funny bit about this is, it was 91 degrees outside the hut, and I'm getting very hot in that sandblast suit. So I thought, what am I gonna do? So I thought to myself, a bucket of water, fill it with ice, put the tube through it and it'll cool it as it comes in to let me breathe cool air. So I did that and I was very happy until it started to rain inside the sandblast outfit due to the humidity outside. This is the result of what you just saw in the previous slide. This is 20 feet by 10 standing in the Rockefeller Center. Uh, off 6th Avenue in the Simon & Schuster building. Um, this was a great fun, um, quite very challenging from my point of view. And as you can see, all these optical elements have been uh, bonded onto the surface of it once it, the sandblasting process was completed. Now this is another lovely story because this drawing started off in the north of Scotland. It started off when I went back, as Tom Beatner has said, go and do some drawings and bring them back to us. So I brought them back and we selected this one, which actually is now in the collection at the museum. It's called Innerland. And as you can see, it's made up of combined uh, joining of cubes together with sandblasting and engraving imagery in them. And then the, most, the thing that always interests me is this business of illusion and color and how what we think about may not really be what it is. So when you look into this piece, because of the refraction and reflection, and the way it starts to dance, the way it's been cut and polished, you see in the center the focal point of an egg, the focal point of a cell, surrounded, as it were, by the protection of symbolic castle walls. And then you enter into a landscape, and you're invited to walk and you're invited to invent into that landscape what you want to imagine. And actually it was in a big exhibition in New York and you couldn't get near it for children. They were inside it. They were walking around in their heads. They were talking about it. It was so wonderful to see their imagination being stimulated by this work. I'm showing you this particular piece because it's one that actually James and I are working on at the moment. And uh, this is a drawing for it. And as you can see, I've put tiny wee marks on all the lines. And the reason for that is that 
it's to let me see exactly what I'm doing when I'm sandblasting it. Um, you'll see more about this kind of process when James and I are talking together a wee bit further on in, the, in, in this uh, talk. This is the result of that that you just saw. So these, all these lines, little, little lines across the lines indicated where I was going to sandblast these different parts. And then I eroded, of course, away the glass into what I felt I wanted to have. This one's, Erin and I often wander around together talking about nature, as James and I do uh, many, many times when we're in company with each other. And this particular last, last uh, winter, we were walking down in the woods and Erin said, look at that face. I said, wait a minute, where? And there it was in the ice. The ice had cracked in such a way that it looked like strange, some strange line drawing of a being that was floating above the leaves, like it was in action, like it was moving with purpose. And from that, because I was involved in another project, actually with Stuben, about an eagle. So I worked on an eagle because there was a big similarity in the thoughts of purpose. That, that ice drawing, shall we say, looked like it was really intent. So I made it intent by changing it into an eagle's head. So the eagle's head, as it were, is coming through the whirling vortex for some purpose. And this is just a drawing for, for a, an investigation which later became a project, which you'll see in the next one. But this is the way I seem to see things often and turn them into linear concepts with shading, with tonal qualities, so you begin to see these strange depths developing. This is the result of it. These are the boardroom doors for S.C. Johnson in Racine in Wisconsin. <clears throat> you can see it's another panel design. And once again, it's got carved uh, pyramid forms and it's got, they have little brass caps on them. And I laughed when, the, when I got the commission and we were talking about it, the ins and outs of, you know, this is my vision. And they said, look, you do what you want, but there's only one thing. Make sure it's totally opaque. Make sure nobody can see into the boardroom. I guess it's, uh, you know, the same kind of things that people don't want to see that goes on in boardrooms, but anyway. This is a large panel that could be adopted or adapted into perhaps a door. This is my dear friend, Tim Wells, and he lives uh, about five or six miles away in the village of Watkins Glen, and he's British, and he does these, he's an incredible wood sculptor. He works in all sorts of different forms in wood. And this is a very simple frame, but we built this frame just to see how this panel would look. And this is us, he's delivering it to the studio, and this is us looking at it in the sunlight. Let's go to Queen's College. And I've got this commission for this disc in the Dean's Administration Building. This disc is about 12 feet in diameter. And once again, you can see the process of the deep carving with added optical elements. The two discs in the center, which you'll see evidence of later on in another piece, these discs were blown by George Kennard down in the studio at Corning. And in the inside of them was, was, coat, was, was, was um, an encasement of blue a gather of blue inside the clear. And I sandblasted through the blue into the clear. Now you won't see it very well on the slide, but you'll see it later on, because inside there's movement. So as the students would come out into the Dean's administration building, these things would twiddle and wink at them. Now this one's a tale in itself. This was the largest, one of the largest pieces that Stuben has ever made. And it was a commission through Santori Corporation in Japan. Uh, it's over seven and a half feet tall. And of course you can see it's held together in a metal sculpture part of the whole. It has the feeling of the setting sun. As you move into it, the minutiae of all the sandblasted imagery, they join and link together, which echo the interconnection of the parts of all of nature on our planet. As they flow, and caress each other, they compete with each other in this piece. 
the most important element is water. Water flowing down from the center of the focal point of the center of the sculpture. And these, the flowing water is made of very large optical prisms that were ground and polished. At this point, I just want to say the wonderful camaraderie that I had with working for Stuben. I never was actually uh, in the company totally, but I was kind of spiritually because I was always a consultant and I always had my own studio and I always did other things than working for Stuben. But Stuben was an incredible, is an incredibly important part of my life. For 40 odd years, thanks to Tom Beatner and I joined the company as a consultant, we've had such adventures together. It's a terrific place to work for. And uh, the camaraderie you get in the blowing room with the people and the things that I learned that I never knew about. So it's a, it was a pure, it is a, still a pure educational existence. But the story of this is, I got flown to Japan, first class if you please, and that's a number of years ago. So be, being a Scotsman, I was very happy to be treated that way. So I get to Japan and we put it up at the symposium and everybody was really happy. And two months later I had to come back and because it had to be dismantled and put in the headquarters. But however, when I got back, I realized there was something wrong with it. There was a part of it that was not quite right. And I said to them, look, this isn't quite right. Did you see it? And they said, oh, yes, yes, we saw it. I said, well, why didn't you say something? He says, well, Stuben is a perfect company. We wouldn't dare say anything about it. And I felt like saying, you know, from a British point of view, you must be joking. <laughs> In Scotland, they would have definitely got after you. So uh, they flew me back and we repaired it, and then I flew back again to Japan, and now it sits in the corporate headquarters in Osaka. This was a wonderful uh, piece that was bought a number of years ago, and the phoenix hangs in the collector's window, and there was a heronary behind, a beautiful pond with herons, and when I was there hanging this piece in the window, the herons were flying back and forward, and you can see the shadows moving across the, moving into the object, shall we say, the sculpture. And the head of the phoenix is staring at you. And remember, that being a disc of dichroic glass embedded behind it, as the sun sets, it moves and changes its qualities of light. Now, this one was exciting, very exciting for me, because my lovely daughter, Erin, has She's been a crazy artist from the first days. And I can't tell you the whole story of her life and we need another talk. But Erin um, has been always involved in drawing from nature, interpreting nature, but not quite copying it. And there was, in a visionary sense. And she was doing a bunch of animals and this more realistic uh, gorilla was apparent. And somebody at Stuben saw this it was the design, design department saw it. And we talked about this and they said, you know, we've been looking for a piece about a gorilla. So they said, how about you and her working together to make this piece? So that's what we did. This is the result of a drawing and me doing the shape of the glass. And I think I did the uh, decorative uh, growth systems in between. <laughs> This is a commemorative piece to Martin Luther King. It stands in Albany in the headquarters. In this piece, you have four columns rising and the tops of the columns are cut in a certain way that the pyramid rising meets with the tops of the columns, which echoes the heavens coming down to the seeds of enlightenment. On the column, which is made by cuts in the four columns of glass, there are fine lines engraved with tiny, tiny jewel-like lenses. The lenses rise to the apex, and when you wander around the piece, the jewels float in space, like they're, they're programmed out into everything. And the enlightenment is so vital to our species that it's such a fantastically poignant piece at this time. Okay. <laughs> This is a little uh, lighter vein, uh, perhaps not for the guys that drove it, but um, Watkins Glen Grand P Trophy. This is a few years ago, 
and Stuben got a job, got a commission to do a trophy for Watkins Glen, which is not far from where we live. So I designed it and we made it in the studio. Uh, and this is it just as it sits uh, in the exhibition room. But I'm just including this one because this is the mad artist with the team that won the, uh, the prize with the uh, piece of the trophy sitting in the foreground. Now this available work uh, situation is to do with a certain gallery. Uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a Scottish chap in this who is also very responsible for it being in that gallery. Thanks, Duncan. <laughs> anyway, um, this is an orb and it reminds one of a beehive. And this, of course, is a blown orb on which I carved into the surface of it in such a way that you got the impression of a beehive, but it moves within itself. So the back and the front, because you can't quite focus on them, you're forced to see them in a certain dimensional, shall we say, almost instability. On the top of it, on the, on the underside of it, is a hemisphere, a hemisphere with engraving, with certain engravings symbolic of whatever you want them to think about them to be. Now, this is a wee, uh, just quick around on the studio. And um, Aaron just took this and uh, just to show it in the lecture. And these are a number of pieces that are sitting on the table uh, in the studio. And just to show you my drawings, I do an awful lot of drawings. Oh, by the way, that happens to be Aaron's gorilla sitting there looking at us. And her elephant also? It, no, it's not engraved yet, but it might happen. <laughs> I just love that engraving she did of the, the elephant. Uh, sorry, drawing, I beg your pardon. Um, Guardian. Guardian is a large piece that's some um, 60 inches tall. I believe that's the size of it. And it's deeply sandblasted, again, with a disc in the center that is affected by the systems of light caressing it. The piece, uh, again, was in two parts in uh, a structural metal frame. Winter's Eye. Winter's Eye sits looking at us as it approaches. In the center is this eye, the eye of winter, as it looks at us as we move around the piece. Again, the dichrylic reflects in the casting that is part of the eye which is bonded onto the disc. The disc, of course, is water cut, as I have maybe didn't say, so are many of them. In it, there are lenses cut uh, with small uh, spheres bonded onto the lenses, at the bottom of which is the symbol of ice on which this form sits. There's your eye. The winking, non-winking, darkness, the eye of winter. The threshold, a threshold in which direction do you want to take when you enter it? The threshold, of course, is sculpted, sandblasted glass in which the same process as I've already discussed is bonded on as the focal point of it as one begins to look at the vortex in the center. The lower piece is a large element of, of sag polished and sandblasted glass which sits within the bottom frame. So you've got two directions in the threshold. The one that leads heavenwards, and I won't tell you where the other one could lead. <laughs> this is the center of that exact piece. And um, it was snowing outside when we took it. Just to give you an idea of what happens when you move looking at the center of the piece, the center of the sculpture. On the top, you see a certain depth in the depth of the sandblasting. <clears throat> Shards of light. Shards of light, again, describing the form, is a disc where thin sheets of glass have been cut and bonded, almost like a pineapple, around the outside of the central disc. When one looks at it under different lighting conditions, they shimmer. They shimmer like shards of light. It rises from a cone, a cone which has a hole like a volcano through the center of it, again with texture, 
which originally started with tinfoil. Of course, it's sag, cut, and polished. It rises into this disc, again, with the dichroic material, which we're going to talk about later on. Eric, may I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Um, are those centers blown? And if so, are they blown in layers? I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get are that. Are the centers blown? No, oh, I'm sorry. You, you'll see about the centers in a wee minute, actually. <clears throat> the centers are disks of glass that have been sandblasted and um, have been sagged in a kiln so that you get a plate-like form. In the center of it, I cut a lens. So the sandblasting imagery, the cut in the center is a lens, and there's another one added to the back, which is the same as the front. So again, you look into this magical land in the center. Tiny, tiny impression of what's on the outside. In this one, there are two formed pieces of glass lying parallel to each other in this frame that is holding the piece together. So you look through the flames uh, beyond each other or into each other. In the center down there, what you're having is this disc. But the interesting other part that isn't so terrific in the photograph, is when I made the bottom part, I remelted glass by simply taking a block of glass, heating it to 350 degrees, putting it in a bucket, of, a bucket of water so it all shattered, and then I reassembled it in a mold, and as it melted and fused together, it formed these very beautiful veils with tiny bubbles, and they looked like the Hubble telescope looking out into inter, interstellar space. These incredible photographs we now get of the universe so, through our abilities to examine it, and uh, that's how this one was made. Um, in fact, here's a wee photograph. Now, a little video that we put. You see in the arc of the bottom, you can see the density in this image because of the lighting of how these mists are all positioned in the curve of the underside of the piece and more of an idea of the, the depth in the sandblasting on the flames on the top. So Aaron uh, took a small uh, slide, of, a small video of this. So you start seeing us peering into the interior of it. <clears throat> Eric, we have several comments that I'd like to address. Um, one is from Naomi Frangos, who says that your inner land inspired her students' work and they just won an award. So thank you, Eric. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, she, she's wonderful. I mean, I, I, she was at teaching at Cornell and we talked together and she actually came and visited the studio and we had a great chat together about possibilities that she's into, which are absolutely magical and way out there somewhere too. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Also, greetings from Ava and Richard Klein, who are watching today. Oh, wonderful. That's terrific. Skin of life. We all exist within it. And in this one, two inverted cones are placed together, bonded together, with this almost a feeling of graffiti, in, in, uh, sorry, engraved into the under surface of them. And of course, as you move around it, you've got to remember all this stationery, all is meant to be moved around because all of my work in, invites movement, invites the audience, invites the person to go into it and have an adventure. They're all sort of symbols of entry into adventures. So in this instance, you see the flames arriving and hovering around the center of this golden disc. But that again is an illusion because that disc changes color. And you're going to be amazed in a minute when James and I discuss exactly what's, where, this, where this has gone. So we'll keep moving. And this gatekeeper, the gatekeeper, would you dare open the gatekeeper? What's the gatekeeper telling you? Is it saying, do enter, it's wonderful in here? Or are they saying something more threatening? At the bottom of this piece, there's a cast disc. This is another project 
where the glass was, was made and then a wax and then a casting on top of this polished cone pointing, which you can't see too clearly in the image, but it's a hemisphere like a pool, the pool of forgetfulness. So if you go through the gate, does that mean you're going to forget? <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorite ones that is in the gallery, Regeneration. Regeneration is a fairly large piece. I, I think it's 36 inches in diameter. And again, it's a, it's a disc of glass that was water jet cut, and I sandblasted the images of the leaf-like forms blossoming out from the central core. In the bottom, there is a little pocket of little jewel-like glass spheres, and they're encased in the base of the piece. Of course, the, the thing that is actually happening is these, these spheres are waiting to rise up into the center, to the center of the eye, the energy of life, and become these very leaves that are floating around the outside of it. So perhaps it is the autumn and the leaves are about to fall, but they're waiting and they're in the wings, as it were, in the heart of life or the cells of life that will propagate life again, as it's done for all these millennia. This is a, this is a piece in the gallery. And uh, th this is a combination of sandblasting and engraving. Now, I have a, another dear friend, Max Erlacher, who is a glass engraver, and him and I have worked together for years. He was an engraver at Stuben, and him and I worked on, the, on the, um, some of these major pieces in our land and also sandblasted designs together. So these abstractions are forms of life, but you're not telling which form, but the suggestions of something in there that we haven't yet discovered wings and flowers and petals and seeds and how do they all join together what do they really mean so the viewer makes up their mind as to what for them these things could be so these four cubes sit uh, enmeshed together standing on this triangular form again above which the arc is placed the arc of life in the universe how much life lives that we know nothing about this is a close-up of the engraving of the bottom uh, cube that sits at the vortex of the piece. And this one uh, is magical. Uh, I, I believe Mary, when I saw her the last time, said, I can't take my eyes off this one, she said, because when you look into the base of it, this wave goes on forever. <clears throat> it's a mirrored box. And inside, I sagged the form of a wave, ground and polished the usual way, placed it in an, under, an illumination underneath, above which four cubes are engraved, showing the type of life that may lie within the sea. But the excitement also is when you walk around it, it's never ending. Our ties are never ending, we hope, forever, as long as we can have them here. As the sun set on this piece, it turned it golden. You can see the sun setting in the trees beyond the studio. It sits in the studio window. Studio is buried up on the top of the woods in an opening in the forest. Now, this piece, we're going to show you a wee movie off. And in the center of it, you can see that, um, or maybe this isn't the one that's next, is it, Aaron? This one? Is this the movie after this one? Or? Yeah. It is. Okay. Getting a little mixed up because there's so many to talk about. Um, this arc, as you can see, is the process that I've already described. The disc is the same process as you're going to see in a second. This is one that Aaron just shot for a moment in the studio. That's the artist examining it, shall we say. You've got to caress your piece after you made it, you see. But anyway, this is the method by which it was made. So I sandblasted the glass, and I bent it, and I, I created this model of the bird's head, whatever kind of bird it is, shall we say. And this is the wax that was made from you, the piece that you've just seen, the prototype piece. And you can see that the sandblasting 
design is in the wax, which was then immersed in the material and removed so the glass could be melted into it. And this is it being placed in this as yet unfinished piece of sculpture. Okay. This, this really beautiful piece, which sat in, in the gallery for a number of years, has, was made by George Kenner, my dear friend work, who works in the museum. Uh, he's one of the major glass blowers in the museum. Him and I worked in this piece and it's encased in two colors, the inner color, blue, purple color. I sandblasted through to the inside of the color and broke through the color, revealing the clear glass. And then we reheated it in the, in, the, in, the, in the kiln and at the right temperature picked it out, picked it up, I should say, and we gently polished it in, out the sandblasting till it became a texture. And you can see how the eyes around the bottom area glint at you, the eyes that are jeweled. But an interesting thing happened that, you know, when you make these things, you never quite know exactly what's going to happen. You have a kind of idea, a vision, where you think you're going. But the really cool thing is they don't quite give you always what you think you're going to get. And sometimes it's, oh, what did I do? And other times it's, oh, my goodness, look what happened. And in this case, it's look what happened. Because under this piece, this magical thing developed in the, in the curvature of the base. And it's actually some of its interpretation of what's above. And I thought it was pretty interesting. We're at 4.45. So I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> We're at 4.45, so just oh, think I meant to. I meant to talk quicker. All right, <laughs> talk quicker. Um, we love you, Eric. This is George. Uh, it, a sandblasted disc. I am polished, he is fire polishing it so we can see what happens when the sandblasting is fire polished. This is me uh, involved in looking at the piece just to see the effect of the polishing of the piece. Okay. This is George in the blowing room together with me and we're uh, making the base for the next couple of pieces I'm going to show you. He's making the piece. And this is the orb that was made uh, with the sandblasted uh, protection, which is then sandblasted in the way that I wanted to sculpt it, ending up as this form. So there's a series of these that we've just made of orbs uh, mounted on crystal forms, like you can see here. Sorry about that. Do you want to go back? Yeah. Right. <laughs> this piece is in the studio just now, and I'm going to show you the center of it so we get an idea. Sorry, I'm just looking for. Yeah, thank you. This is what happens in the center of this, this blown form. There's a, a, a cone at the base of the cone. There is a, it's a lens cut that looks like an eye. And when you move around the piece, it interreflects and stares at you like a tiny eye watching you. Uh, here's another view of the artist working on one of these orbs. Um, I, I got this machine from Max, a loan of the machine from Max. I think it was made in Queen Victoria's reign uh, because it's all brass and it give, makes you be able to put the longitudinal and latitudinal lines on the orb of glass, which I have done here to show how it works, how it's placed and how it's developed. Now, just as we move on, the magic of it all. Staring at the light and the sunlight on the pond one morning, a little fish pond I made near the house, this lovely wee creature appeared. And I thought, my God, it's life dancing in the cosmos because the pond was rippling and the stars were dancing in the pond and life came up and looked at it in the morning and it was poignant to me and I took this close-up photograph of its eye 
The eye of what? The eye of nothingness? The eye of everything? Where, do, where does the eye, what is the eye symbol? The symbol of it. Or a jewel casually dropped by the natural world. Or this one of this little dragonfly being born and we looked at the eye and I grabbed the close-up lens on the camera and took some photographs of the precision of the eye of the dragonfly. And it was worn by the sun as it was born. It opened its wings and it waved goodbye and we never saw it again. I'm showing you this one is, uh, I'm showing you this because it's to do with color and to do with the fact of light. The evening and the sun is shining on the fall trees and the light from the leaves is reflected into the piece. Okay. Now, this is James and I coming. Uh, James, you are still there. <laughs> okay. I'm still here. Oh, is it, I should I wake up now? Okay. I don't wake up, will you? God, honestly, <laughs> honestly, you know, when you've been friends this long, you don't know what's going to happen. But anyway. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So this is the center of a piece. And uh, this actually has got poignant significance to James and I. So James, you say something now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, my turn to talk. All right. Yeah, your turn. Um, to yeah. So um, I think what we're seeing here, uh, as you saw in many of the pieces that Eric just showed, uh, they have this central region where there's a play of color uh, and light through the through the middle. Uh, that may change, for example, if the piece is put in a window and the sun is going across the sky. And uh, this was an idea that um, Eric had, and I understand wanted to had been wanting to pursue for some time. Um, this idea of how to get the the uh, to have some additional dynam dynamism in the in the pieces. Yeah. Uh, with color. So we yeah, that, met. We met. It was wonderful. Can I just tell them about just that one piece? This, this was yes, do. two sheets of glass, large sheets of glass, put in a gas kiln with metal spikes and sagged them over the metal spikes. So you got these breast-like protuberances in the glass. When they were mounted in a black box, they were lit uh, from the outside and suddenly the reflections were all dancing inside. And of course, our, all the stuff we're doing now is dancing. It's always going and dancing and intriguing you into an adventure. And I've often thought, God, I wish I could make that happen. And I knew all I was doing was kind of artificially happening by the consistency of what things were made of. But James has this magic that he brought to it all. And the, here's, the, here's the magic fellow up there on the uh, uh, left-hand side. And, and here's uh, the other guy that's been talking to you with the latest and newest piece that James and I are making. So. James, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? And what is it that brings that magic uh, to, the, to the glass that Eric creates? Right, yes, uh, I'd be happy to. So uh, my background is actually in software engineering. Uh, worked for about 35 years uh, in different uh, roles as a software engineer. That included some time working for NASA uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, although at the time, in the 1990s, it was actually called Space Station Freedom. Uh, also time working for uh, IBM and some other companies. Um, by the way, um, these vicious rumors that have been circulating that I've heard lately about it being my code that caused a Mars rover to drive off a cliff, I, I can tell you are wholly unfounded. Um, it really it was just a shelf a few feet high. It was not a cliff at all. <clears throat> yeah, right. Um, so yeah, all during this time I had a uh, on the side, this love affair with abstract art and animated imagery. 
and also uh, glass art. And so what what I um, what I'm bringing to our work here is um, this animated imagery that I create through custom software that is uh, unique to each piece that we make. And one of the things that's uh, notable about it is that it's not a video. Um, it's actually the software runs in real time as you're looking at the piece and it's not a loop. Um, there are common themes that run throughout the piece, um, but each time they appear, they're subtly different. And that may be in uh, color or form or the way that they move with, within the piece. Thank you, James. And I believe you have some examples that are coming up. Yes. Okay. Uh, th this is the first piece James and I ever made. Uh, this was the first adventure we had, ephemeral light. But James and I fell in love with each other because of my son and his lovely daughter. Because James was invited with my son and, and his daughter uh, to have a wee cup of tea together. And we got talking together and we began to realize there was some real interest in what we were talking about. So uh, actually James uh, and I are still together. Uh, Kyle and his lovely daughter parted but the seeds were set and James and I are still having a fantastic relationship together. Sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great story. Um, so yeah, I, I remember one of the first times we met, uh, we were having a meal at a cafe and Eric had his iPad and he was showing me all these incredible images of his work, many of which uh, you've, you've seen uh, today. And I was thinking, sitting there thinking, this is absolutely amazing. And, you know, I'm at this stage, I'm really not sure what I'm, I'm bringing to this party, but uh, I can see there's an adventure here that I don't want to miss out on. And uh, what I think is sort of fascinating about that, too, is I visited. Stop it. Oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> I, Tell me about that. I visited Corning, Corning Museum of Glass many times over the last 40 years and, you know, looking at wonder with all these amazing pieces, uh, including Innerland, uh, uh, which is Eric's piece, and had no clue that someday, you know, I would be maybe a little piece of the story that, uh, you know, keeps going on and on in the glass art world. I'll flick this one. Okay. This, this is an amazing part of the story you're about to see.
Okay. <laughs> Act two. James, <laughs> you're still there, mate. Right. Okay. So, so that, uh, that, that, is, that is a composite together of various aspects of these pieces. Um, one of them is in the, 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 one of the two discs coming together is in the Imagine Museum in St. Petersburg. And of course, the one, the, the, the central one, which you're now looking at, a composite of it, is uh, behind Duncan on the wall somewhere. <laughs> okay, sorry, James. <laughs> oh, no, that's great. So this is uh, our, yeah, the video shows the Mysterium series of works. That's, that's what we've called our collaborations. And uh, Mysterium Magnum is a Latin term used by ancient alchemists, and it means great mystery. And I think that's sort of key to what we're uh, hoping to achieve ourselves, some sort of modern day alchemy of glass and light, uh, wood and wire, and these sort of arcane skills that we each bring, and uh, hoping to capture a sense of curiosity and awe that we feel as we experience the universe around us and the universe within us. And that is that sense that we are surrounded and permeated by mystery and that that is a source of profound wonder. And uh, that's, that's what we're hoping to yep. capture, at least in part. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this one has a nice little story about it. I'll be kind of brief. Um, but it was in the gallery, and um, some people had come in. Uh, uh, James and I, by the way, as you know, we're two and a half hours away. Uh, so we drove before drove a U-Haul down to the gallery, and we put it up in the gallery and um, said our things, and we talked to each other, and then we left to go way back home up north and a few, I don't know how long it was, but we got a call from the gallery saying that a client had bought the piece. And we thought, wow, that's wonderful. Oh my goodness, isn't that terrific? But what actually happened, I believe, when they told me, this lady came in, uh, an older lady, and she was asked to see Eric Hilton's work. So they said, oh, he's over here. So she started looking at all the work and she stopped and, thought this i didn't say anything i don't think and then she said oh well i'm i'm going to go out to lunch now so that you know that happens in the gallery and this i'm sure they thought oh well she's she's had a look at the stuff and she's going to consider and so on and two hours so came by went by and she walked in and she's went back and started looking at the stuff and then she sat and stood there and said i want that one so that was the one that she decided to take and they asked her where it should be delivered to. And she said, oh, Buffalo, New York. Well, James and I, for two and a half hours in a, in a U-Haul, had lugged it down. Days. Days. Two and a half days. Two and a half days. Oh, two and a half days. Oh, you see, the Scots imagine they're flying sometimes. <laughs> yeah. In a lousy U-Haul, but sorry, U-Haul. And, and we, stepped, we slept in a few hotels that you don't want to sleep in. Uh, and then we came here, we, down to you folks, put it up. And uh, in two and a half days, it had to go back up to, to Buffalo, which, which we, of course, didn't have to take. And it was delivered in Buffalo. And uh, James and I went up uh, to Buffalo. And it's a lovely little house. And we, she took us in, had tea. Uh, they, ha they had a beautiful, she had a beautiful dog, a rescue dog. So me being the way I am with animals, I let James put all the technology together while I rolled on the floor and kissed the dog. Um, then uh, it turned out that she had been a professor uh, at the University of Buffalo. But it was, I love these stories about the folk that come in and buy these things, buy these pieces. They're doing it for some, maybe a subconscious need or just being awed by the way it is. 
and they'd never seen anything quite like it before. And I mean, that's what the gallery is about in so many ways, presenting the unknown or the known to some, but the unknown to many. And here's one for you. <laughs> this is a little mischievous one because the artist gets into his own work. So this one, James put together. That's James there, all ready to go. And my dear friend, Tim Wells, who's, who's an English, a Brit, as we say. And Tim is down in Watkins Glen, and he is one of the most incredible uh, guys working in sculpture and wood, uh, and mostly, and always mostly in wood. So this piece, <clears throat> in it, of course, is the vibrancy, the magic of James. But we thought, well, since an artist always gets uh, deeply involved in his own work, as a little joke, it might be neat, nice to put my head in it. <laughs> okay, this is our last piece at the moment. Uh, that one was specially to make Duncan cry. <laughs> I'm sorry, but when that tune started to play with the waves coming in on the rocks, I sat there saying, don't be an old twit. It's just a movie about what we're doing. But there was something about the emotion of these waves coming in and involved in caressing the rocks as they've done for millennia after millennia. And that was kind of the essence of this piece in the way these these images never come back to the same and all the time they're recreating a mood recreating a mood every instance of their life when they're alive in the studio in the piece but as you can see they always follow pathways and then they caress the whole being of the piece they make it almost disintegrate and then they emphasize it there's some there that they just look like a, a volcanic eruption is taking place and the actual sculpture kind of dissolves into the piece and then mysteriously comes back in a tracery and re-evolves itself, which is we all do as human beings. Okay, James. <laughs> okay, James. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this is, this was, Eric mentioned this is our most recently made piece. And uh, there's really two sort of major innovations, I think, with this piece that I want to point out. Um, one of those is, uh, is a creative innovation, and that is the way in which we've combined our art over the entire surface of the piece. In previous pieces, we had sort of openings in uh, the middle of the sculpture where uh, the glass serves as a kind of portal into the imagery. But now, with this piece, I feel like we've arrived at somewhat of a different place where uh, the, uh, the sculpture, the glass uh, itself has become a kind of landscape. And the imagery you could think of as being, uh, say, the winds and the waves and rivers and rain that run through it. And uh, you, know, you know, you might think of it as a, 
Uh, the sculpture itself is a novel world and its weather, and the world and the weather are inextricably linked. The second innovation is technical in nature, but also really adds to the um, to the novelty of it, and that's the uh, edge lighting that eliminates the need for uh, shining a spotlight on this piece. So it's got uh, lighting right around the edge of the glass, and that uh, helps to enable a sort of play of shadow and light across the surface as the images are uh, evolving, uh, you know, in their own right. So James, this is all one piece that we're looking at with the with the different colors and and patterns running through it, correct? These yeah, that's right. Exactly. So we okay. well, yeah, caught the piece here at different moods, uh, right? And right. normally these would transition smoothly from one to another, but it's it's a challenge to capture that in still. Um, that's why we do the movies often. Actually, I, I often sit up in the studio of an evening, it's up in my studio, with a wee glass of wine and just sit and watch this. I mean, it can go, it goes on forever. It's <laughs> incredible. It's so meditative. And then it evolves and evolves and evolves. Okay, sorry. Um, my darling daughter's off at uh, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's, she's giving me a wink. Well, you're getting your wait. The, the cane will come out in just a minute, right? <laughs> Pull you yeah, off the no, what, afterwards the pain will come out. I don't know what it's like around here. <laughs> well, Eric, we have uh, we have several comments. Uh, Dina Lowenbach says hello and sends her love. And uh, Eva Klein also says she bought your Cosmic Sun in 2010. Ah. And it sits in the dining room, and they absolutely love it. Oh, uh, wonderful. So, so Thank many you. people are saying um, that they love the work, that it's really beautiful. Um, and we are just loving the, the way that you, uh, alone in your work, but also you and James, bring together this wonderful sense of eternity and, uh, you know, cosmic consciousness, I guess you'd say, into your work. This these images here on the left also they're very much like the page of a book you know and you can um look at a page and just keep reading and reading and absorbing and absorbing the knowledge that that the words are trying to transmit to you absolutely beautiful thank you well just as we come to a conclusion just want to show you a few brief sketches uh of just you know lifting and putting and looking and seeing where things might go because things evolve each thing evolves out of the other in some way and every direction is suggested by something from the one before and the one to come and these are just like drawings i mean they are actual three-dimensional forms but these were just put together in order to show we don't exactly know where we're going but we sure are looking to find out and uh, that's why I just included these. And um, I think uh, what, in, in the end, this is me leaving the north of Scotland and it showed me a rainbow, which was, I hope you have a good life and don't forget to come back as if I ever could. <laughs> and I thought I'd put this in to wish all of us as we move into the new year, which is not so far along, that the rainbow shines for all of us and i hope at the end of it we really find what we want to find in life great thank you thank you eric thank you so thank you much. eric that was absolutely wonderful i i hope everybody enjoyed it i'm sure they have uh if you can see this work in person you will get mesmerized you will want to sit there with a glass of wine, just like Eric was saying, we'll be happy to provide that and give you an experience um, that you can also take home. Uh, but thank you very much uh, for joining us. And thank you, James. Thank you, Eric and Aaron and the whole team and all of you for being here this week. Have a great evening. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Duncan. It's great to know you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. All right. Have a great evening. Next week, we will be visiting with Martin Rosal. So we hope you can join us then as well. Take care and thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.